Um, if indeed the referendum is approved, I've been asked where will that money go? So you see different icons in the middle of this page. I'd like to add some more details to the answer to that question. So it would be our goal to not only retain quality staff, but over time also attract the staff to join our school district. In a school district budget, approximately 80% of the overall budget is allocated to staff. And that's all kinds of staff. That's teachers, administrators, custodial staff, maintenance staff. Anyone that's employed in the school district is considered staff. We also want to sustain our educational opportunities. This is our teaching and learning that occurs uh, in the classroom and outside of the classroom. So we offer high quality education programs in our classrooms in pre-K through grade 12. We offer traditional learning in Athens Elementary, middle and high school. We also have a charter school, Maple Grove Charter School. We offer activities and athletics and additional programming that makes this a full rounded opportunity for our students to attend the School District of Athens. We also provide essential and educational technology and about 5% of our budget goes in this area. We are a one-to-one -one school district. That means every staff member and every student has a technology device. We buy them once, but like other things, um, they eventually need to be retired and we have to replace our technology. So we constantly have to have a plan to maintain technology as part of our 21st century learning skills for our students. And approximately 5% of our budget, um, if a operational referendum were to be approved, would be to rebuild our financial stability. We have utilized our fund balance um, over the last couple of years to pay down our expenditures. We need to rebuild that fund balance. We also have some outstanding debt that we need to pay off. So that is a combination um, to take a look at if indeed the operational referendum money um, and the voters approve this referendum, we would look to distribute the monies in that way. So why now? <clears throat> Again, the district is in a current situation where we are making some budget reductions. Um, we have an unbalanced budget of approximately $900,000 that we need to reduce and we've overspent the revenue that we have. Um, we were transparent and honest with our community during the past six to 12 months that this would be the first step in this process. We are following through and taking care of some of those needed reductions. It's a very challenging, difficult time to um, reduce your budget by about $900,000. But we also recognize we have to be very good stewards of our money. So we are working through that process right now. As I've indicated, we've exhausted our fund balance, so if the voters approve an operational referendum, it will be our goal again to rebuild that fund balance. Um, that's a good economic uh, accounting practice as well. We're currently relying on some <coughs> excuse me, short-term borrowing to balance our operational budget and sustain our operations. Again, we want to pay back some of that debt and loan and only use that option when absolutely necessary moving forward. So even by doing all of those things, we still have a shortfall ahead of us with our projected five-year budget. And at the bottom, again, a true transparency, we want our, our community to know that if indeed uh, the voters um, approve the operational referendum, we'd be able to continue to meet those programming needs of all of our students, pre-K through grade 12, in both our traditional and our charter school. We'd also be able to continue to pay for our ongoing daily operational costs. And we'd like to begin uh, to pay for some deferred maintenance projects. Um, right now, in working uh, with uh, Beth Stanky and Jamie Hanchke, who oversees our operations and maintenance department, we have deferred as many as our maintenance projects as we can uh, because we don't have some fund balance to be able to pull on. So. And to be transparent, if the operational referendum question is not approved, um, the Board of Education will need to consider consolidation. That is not consolidation internally within our district, but that's the potential to consolidate with neighboring districts, or they'll have to discuss closing, because we must remain um, cognizant of and managing that long-term financial stability for the district. It's page one, if you want to follow us on page two. Again, we wanted to recognize following uh, the November 2022 uh, failed operational referendum, we listened to the feedback that we received from our community. So we again are asking for a four-year non-reoccurring, it begins and it ends. Um, and the Board of Education has uh, really listened to you that this is only a four-year non-reoccurring uh, referendum. We'd like to talk um, at depth now around some historical school tax mill rate data. So there's a graph at the top of this page. Um, and we'd like to take you back to 2012. <coughs> and at that time, the mill rate in this area in Athens was $11.57.
you see that that was uh, very stable for three years. The reason because in 2011, the community was asked at that point to approve an operational referendum. It was a reoccurring, which means it would stay with our budget forever. It's that ongoing money. Um, the ask was $350,000. And so for three years, the mill rate was stable. Um, following the approval, the voters said yes to that operational referendum in 2011. You see the mill rate increases just a bit in 2015, and then it starts to decrease and you see some fluctuation up until 2022, when our mill rate was the lowest it's been in the last several years, and that was $5.12. Our suggestion for this four-year non-reoccurring, the data that we have, the projection model that we're following with the budget, is indicating that in year one, the mill rate would be $11.13 or in the year 23, 24, that first year out of four. And then it would decrease um, into the $9, mid $9 range. We too, as a district leadership team and a business office staff, are looking for that stability that the mill rate would become stable as it was back in 2012. However, it's lower. We wanna also draw attention to the stability is our goal, but it is also a still a lower mill rate. We do recognize it is significantly higher than what you've experienced in the past year. I'm going to pause for a moment and let that add some details. Um, so I'm just going to talk about some of the key pieces that play a part in the mill rate. Um, so the mill rate is determined by we have student enrollment, parent choice programs that the parochial schools are part of, as well as any declining enrollment or operational referendums that all plays a part in it, as well as state aid. So if the state aid goes up the tax levy goes down. It's just a matter of shifting that burden to the taxpayers or the state. Um, so the operational referendum, the non-recurring four years, the ask in year one is a bit higher, and that is to help rebuild the fund balance to about 5% of the operating expenses in year one. Uh, we wanna be mindful of the impact on the taxpayers, so that's why the decrease is in years two, three, and four. Um, so then that would equal out on a $100,000 home, that mill rate would equal out to be um, an, an increase in your, your school taxes by $601. So on the left hand side of this uh, part of our flyer, we indicate some of this information again, that we recognize the greatest tax impact would be in year one and it would decline after that. <coughs> It's too premature at this point, although we have suggested numbers uh, for that mill rate, they'll be certified each year in October. The state of Wisconsin certifies our data. So we'll be watching that. We know that it won't be any higher, but we'll maintain that and watch it as well. Um, and we wanna draw attention to, we've been asked sometimes, um, is the tax um, increase my total tax bill? This is only for school taxes. The information we're sharing with you this evening is only specific to your school tax. So that's important uh, to recognize because there are other parts of a tax bill. So that takes us through our two-page um, informational flyer and the information we wanted to share with you this evening. Um, but we'd like to open it up to questions um, that we might be able to answer that you have or maybe you've brought questions from family or friends or neighbors in and around uh, Athens or our townships. So the question is, how much money in the operational referendum is identified for repairing our track? Um, right now, that would be no monies. Uh, the monies that we'll be getting if the voters approve the operational referendum do need to be used to offset expenses um, to be able to refund, uh, build up that fund balance um, and then look to um, some of the deferred maintenance projects. The track um, potential cost would be well over a million dollars, so it would not be um, it would not be a conservative decision at this point to go ahead and allocate anything to a, a larger capital project in the immediate future, I should say. Yes. Um, you said there's uh, several deferred maintenance projects. Can you explain what any of those are? 
Sure. Um, well, there are some large ones. For example, um, over time, we'll need to look to replace um, parts, if not all, of our roofs at all three of our buildings um, at the charter school, the elementary, the middle, and the high school. Um, our windows at the middle and high school are quite aged, as well as some of our additional HVAC systems. Those are some larger deferred maintenance projects. Um, if you have children here at the elementary or you are here for other activities, you might notice that our playground here is in need of some um, repair or replacement. That would be a large scale capital project as well. Um, there are some other projects um, also related to, um, let's see, um, windows, have, um, windows uh, freezer, cooler in our middle high school. We need to look at some of our um, appliances in our kitchens. Um, we need to maybe look at some new plumbing in one of our buildings. So um, things that continue to operate, um, but if you are a homeowner, I can equate it to if you don't tend to your maintenance over time, pretty soon you might experience a lot of things that need to be fixed. So um, we're doing our best. Um, we're certainly providing safe learning opportunities for our students and our staff, but we do know to be cognizant of some bigger things that are gonna come in the years ahead. Yes. You mentioned the roofs. Yes. What, didn't they do some of them not that long ago? I just thought I remember seeing them up there with styrofoam and stuff laying and redoing something. Did they do sections or, or how long ago was that? Any clue? There were some systems. So, so the question is um, how, how, in what time period has there been some work done on the roofs? Um, I've been here 18 months. In my experience, I haven't seen people on the roofs. <laughs> Um, that's not to say they aren't doing small projects of some sort. Um, I can say that um, I was at Maple Grove today and they were clearing the snow off the roof and the ice and we were talking about that roof um, had been um, built and replaced in four different sections. So over time there'll be sections that come due for replacement sooner instead of others. So we're taking a look at, at that potential project over time. Um, so any of that answers your question. I'm not. I just, I just thought I remembered within probably the last five years or so redoing some of the roof on the school here, but I don't remember. Sure, I just remember I'm having stacks of styrofoam up there for the sheets. I think it was some uh, systems, like air conditioners and different things. No, I wasn't. It was styrofoam. I saw uh, styrofoam. Yeah. I'm so just curious if it was a section or not. And those type of decisions, um, we would put, we would invite, obviously, Mr. Hanschke, and if we needed to do a facility <coughs> with an outside group, they would come in and give us um, information about how old our different parts of our systems are, and then we would prioritize um, with Mr. Hanschke's help what's going to be done first in a timely manner. We have a one to five, um, a five to ten year plan right now, taking a look at what's most urgent and necessary. Yes. Um, this is not a kind of a statement, I guess. Uh, I'm Jim Oideman. Um, this is my wife, Julie. Um, we're building in town here. Um, and I just kind of want to tell everybody our story. We put it in the record for, for review. Um, so if you want to read it, you can. Or <coughs> pass it around. Um, we, I student taught under Pat Kelly. My wife taught in the district for how many years? Eight years. Um, we taught, I taught in Colby. She taught in Abbotsford for a while. And we decided to open and enroll our kids here to Athens for multiple reasons. Um, one of them was the program, especially the title program um, and the staff here. <coughs> um, so after this referendum failed, the first one, um, it was really concerning. And then starting to talk to people in the community, um, we are really questioning why we're moving back to Athens if there may not be a school here. What's the pur purpose? Um, that's the reason why we moved here. So um, I would just like to kind of state, you know, we did live in Dorchester and they did close the elementary school down there. And ever since they closed the elementary school there, there's been more buildings tearing down than built. So it's very concerning what's gonna happen to the community that we are planting our roots in. Um, I never thought we'd discuss about selling our house before we finish a building. So um, one of the things that I, I go all in when I see a problem, and I've been kind of getting the gauge of the community, been asking people um, that I know from when, I lived, when we lived here for eight years, um, there's a lot of misinformation. One of them is the track. Um, the other one is people think that the schools, like you, I'm glad you stated it, I was at the last meeting with Tony Johnson 
a lot of people think that they're just going to join the elementary school with the high school and that kind of consolidation question on there. Um, so what I, I guess, I, I'm, I'm gauging that most people here are for the school being open. And at the Town of Johnson meeting, it was brought up is how do you get the no votes to be informed? I mean, I asked a, a gas station attendant and just when I was there, what her thoughts were. And she's like, ah, oh, they, they've done this before. It's not that big of a deal. It's the school still be open. Um, from my point of view, I, the way I see it is we did some research. There's 71% of the school districts in the state of Wisconsin that are running off a referendum. So it's actually, I wouldn't say the school board's fault, the past administration, um, I would say it's the way that they have our funding for our schools. That's what needs to be addressed after. But right now, by voting no, you're closing the door to see maybe a fix of it. So, um, what's the other thing? We did, uh, we did make an informational sheet that we put in the um, Salesman Sam too. Also, a couple things that we heard around the community. What I would suggest is contacting five people that you know in Athens, and because that's the only way it's going to change the to go around. I, that, I mean, they're not. I mean, I don't know how many notebooks are here. So, but I would say, I think it needs to be a grassroots thing where you have to go out and talk to five people or ten people. We talked about that at the last meeting. So that's just my take on it. Yeah. One thing that I found interesting, and uh, my body's saying, and I think I emailed you several times on this because I couldn't believe it was true, is the next time that we're available, and maybe talk about this because I came in a little late, is the next time we can actually go back and potentially ask the taxpayers for more money is actually a year from now. And I, I don't know if you want to just maybe, I don't know if you can that already or if you can explain that a little bit more. Sure. Uh, so Bonnie made the statement that um, we have the option as we are pursuing to go to referendum and have a question on the ballot this April, April of uh, 2023. There's not an option to place a referendum question on the ballot in November of 2023. So the next time we would be able to come back to our voters would be spring of 2024. Um, and for those of you and, and some are in the audience that were at the Town of Johnson meeting last week, we spoke a little bit to this. Um, we don't have additional revenue to continue to operate. There'll need to be some other difficult decisions and conversations had past this April. Um, I can't forecast exactly what those will be, um, but to wait until April of 2024 to ask the voters again, we may be in a very precarious situation at that time. Um, I mentioned earlier, um, we have some short-term debt and loans um, on the books. That's a typical um, practice in this industry because when we get our revenue uh, both from the state and from um, our taxes vary in a 12-month period so it's a it's a practice that the school districts uh, follow but over time uh, we need to pay back that debt so we can't keep that debt on our books and it's short-term borrowing so just thinking of that context of short-term borrowing we're in uh, March of 2023 to consider paying that back in a timely manner needs to happen um, well before April or any time in spring of 2024. So this first year's uh, amount would cover that entire so short-term debt or is this gonna go on for the full four years? So the question is, will this first uh, year, the 1.6 um, that's being requested by the taxpayer um, take care of the debt? Um, Yes and no. That's where I lean on the business office, uh, business office manager and her team. It's a timing. So if there is debt due, that certainly is going to take priority. Paying our staff is a requirement. Paying our insurance and our bills. So we go back and take a look at the budget that we build um, each year and we have to prioritize. So that $1.6 in year one would be added to our overall revenue. And then we have to look at when those bills come due to get us through that first year. 
what we had uh, suggested in um, some information we shared at a board meeting, I believe in January, was um, a smaller amount potentially would be left to start to rebuild that fund balance because we have to pay our bills first, if you will. Um, and then we would continue to look for that financial stability in the next subsequent three years. Yes, Jim. I would, uh, last I was at the Tony Johnson meeting, I learned a lot about the mill rate. The mm -hmm. little red school, um, the when you brought on that, can you guys elaborate what happened? You brought on lower priced land, right? Which affected the overall rate of the value of the whole district of Athens, which lowered the mill rate, right? Was that something? It, I mean, I know it's more a little more complicated than that, <laughs> but I still, we, I mean, yeah, Tommy Allenbecker was there and we were trying to figure out, <laughs> him, he was sitting there doing the formula and trying to figure out the formula and it was, it's very complicated, so I was wondering if you can elaborate that, just because I thought it was very interesting. Sure, Beth would be happy to speak to that. So the uh, <laughs> no, sorry, <no. laughs> sweet her, it's good. She got the answers. Been waiting all day. Right? No, <laughs> that's what I'm um, so the mill rate, and so the the state of Wisconsin has a revenue limit. So the the school district is limited at that dollar amount. So. When we brought on Maple Grove, we increased the property values, which then decreased our state aid. So it's just a balancing act of shifting where that money is coming from, either state or the property values. So that's why the mill rate goes down, because the mill rate is calculated from um, that revenue or the property values divided by that um, uh, levy that the, the board sets. So, <laughs> I mean, so the way that you're saying that that works, I'm just curious. Let's just say Athens were to close, you could actually infringe on another district. They would be in the same situation where they bring the property value, you bring, you're bringing the more property value up, let's just say Edgar, for example. We could be sitting in the same, almost the same situation with Edgar having issues now because their mill rate drops, right? Am I following that right? Or? Or, I mean, I know there's a, that's a loaded question there, but. Um, that's really forecasted pretty far in advance, but I would, I would make a positive assumption that, you know, their staffing would change, their student enrollment would change, their property amount would change. So there would be a lot of moving pieces to whichever district the, the Athens would dissolve into. Um, I'll add into that if we're sharing with somebody in the community that um, it's sometimes really difficult to compare any of our schools and there's 471 of them in the state. Each has their own story and when I say the story, it's about how many students are in their district, what the demographic of that district is, how much land they have, what types of state aid they receive. For example, um, we have a significant amount of land in the schools of Athens so we receive some additional transportation aid. Not every district in the state gets that. Um, we receive what's called sparsity aid, again, because we have a lot of land and other districts don't have that. So it's really hard to understand each district's story and do one-on-one -on -one or apple-to-apple -apple comparisons because there's so many different factors that do impact each school district. What we have shared in other meetings is important to know that if um, we were to consolidate with a neighboring district or more, because it may not just be as simple to say, we use Hector, let's say Athens and Edgar combined and we were consolidated now one district, I think about where different families live in our district, that could be like a two hour drive for some little people on a bus. I don't think that's in the best interest of families. And in addition, the Edgar district may not have the space, they may not have an interest. So that's a very um, difficult, complex conversation that would actually be led by um, a subcomponent of a Department of Public Education in Madison. Um, but it's important to know that if we were to consolidate, a taxpayer in the schools of Athens would now pay the taxes, and Jimmy alluded to this a little bit, to whichever district your property is now associated with. So it's not um, as if if we were to consolidate, you no longer would ever pay a school tax. It would be a, the school tax that would be connected to now whatever your home school district, your resident district would be. That was a question that came up at one of our other meetings, so I just thought I would clarify that as and well. And debt from our district, obviously, if, you know, we don't pass referendum, we still have all this debt, 
if you consolidate, that goes with, there would have to be. I don't know if that's an accurate that's statement. Those, again, it's a complex um, process that we would be provided guidance from the Department of Public Instruction. They would work the, through that with us, so. Question, yes. Well, and I'd just like to add, if we get split up to different areas and we're paying, then you're paying their rate, if, um, and I looked it up, um, everyone around us at this point is a higher rate than we are. And most of them, I think there's only two, I'll check my list again just to make sure, but I think there's only yeah, maybe two that would be lower than what Athens referendum for April 4th is asking for. So you would be paying this tax rate, if not higher, being split up into other districts around us. No, I was just, when Beth was explaining the balancing, because we took on more property in that year, the school, st the school still ended up with approximately the same dollars in the end, though. Right? Roughly? Okay. Yeah, it's not like, you know, yeah, our taxes went down because we took on more property, but yet you, uh, the school kind of ended up with the same number in the end. So we didn't get shortchanged here, I think. Um, and the statement we like to say is it's, it's shifting the burden of, you know, you mentioned this, yeah. Beth, it's shifting the burden. So if, if the, the state's burden is more, we get more um, state aid from, from the state because we have less property value, now property value is having created, you know, it's kind of this back and forth to your point, Andy, it's not as if we become um, property rich and we all of a sudden have an extra million dollars as revenue. The state looks and puts into this uh, complicated school finance formula, and someone brought that up as well, it's all the numbers that feed into the formula to equalize and determine how much money we're going to get both from our taxpayers, from the state, and then other aides as well. So, good question. Um, and yes. So, if they would have left it at where it was last year, we actually would have gained money and no one would have benched. To a point. Well, so, Andy, I was going to paraphrase what um, <laughs> what is this is. where we are. Um, so, Still wouldn't be out of the water, well, but. And, now, and I'm going to take that as, uh, as an opportunity to just give another example. So Andy's question is, you know, if we, if we had not assumed a new school, and it always takes money whenever you open and operate a new property, in this case, <coughs> school, um, would we or would we not be in the same situation? I think I'd use this as an example as well. We saw a trend starting in 2011, where as a school district over about a 10-year period of time, we decreased approximately 100 students. We had peaked at that time around 500, and in its lowest um, enrollment in this area, we were at 382 about five years ago. So as we watch enrollment continue to decline, then we also get less state aid because we have less students. So um, the assumption is if there's less students, you don't need as much money to operate. So to Andy's point, would we maybe be sitting here having a similar conversation absent the acquisition of a new school? There's a strong potential that we could because as your enrollment continues to decrease, at some point if our spending does not also significantly decrease and re reductions occur, we would be sitting here talking to our taxpayers just having a little bit different conversation. So um, just something to consider. Is our enrollment still de decreasing? Um, is, is the question, uh, Ramani, is our enrollment still decreasing? Um, the answer is no. Um, we actually increased this year um, by a handful of students. And so we didn't decrease, we didn't stay exactly flat, we've increased a little bit. Um, when we built our projected five-year um, budget model, um, which began last year, we'll feed into the next four years, that's information we used um, around the operational question. We did keep our enrollment flat at 425, that's a conservative uh, number. We are optimistic though that as it continues to increase that we will receive some more additional aid. So um, we built the model around 425, um, but we're optimistic it will increase over the next several years. Why will it increase? No. So the question is why will it increase? Um, so as I mentioned, we acquired um, a charter school, Maple Grove Charter School. So we have a new um, facility in our district. And yes, we recognize it takes money to open and operate that school. But there are some students in that school that were not part of our district only just two years ago. We do have resident students who might have been in one of you know, our traditional elementary school, but they've chosen Maple Grove. We also have students um, whose family resides in maybe some of the neighboring communities. 
So the charter school is unique and different, and what we're finding is some families want that for their children. So they're willing to drive because we don't offer transportation. So if you can get your child or children to our charter school, then you can enroll them and it's called open enrollment. So that's where we're starting to experience some increase in our enrollment is families that don't live here in the village or one of our townships, but are close enough to bring their child or children to our school. Um, and I should say it's not just the charter school. We are seeing the larger sum of students at the charter, but elementary, middle and high, we also have families choosing Athens and open enrolling in. Um, Unfortunately, we also have some families, for all the right reasons, according to what their family needs are, who also enroll out. Um, I can share with you in this current year, um, we have 17 students to the good in open enrollment in, because you have to compare the two. Um, it's also important to note that um, open enrolled students in and out, money follows them to us. It also follows them off or into another district, and we don't count them at the same rate we do for our own resident students. So again, part of that complex funding formula um, but we celebrate if families are choosing Athens because we must be doing something really, really great here that they want to come here even if they don't reside here. And how wonderful if over time they decide to move here and this becomes their community as well. So we want to stay competitive. How many students are transferring out? So we had Ada, I can get that free. This year we had uh, 67 students um, transfer or open enroll out <coughs> and 84 in. So hence the difference of a positive 17. And when will you be getting the rest of the revenue for the April Grove plan? Is that the last referendum? It was stated that we're only getting a portion of the revenue for the state aid or the state funding and we won't get that. When will we get the full value of that school? So the question is, when will we, will we see the full value from the enrollment for the students at Maple Grove? Um, so the student count is based on a three-year rolling average. So each year the state takes our last three years, averages it out, and that's the number of students we can count. Um, so it's a little bit more complex than that too because we have our, our students that are physically in our building, our headcount students, we have to subtract out the students that um, I have to go the right way. The students that are are residing in another district but attending our school, and then we add back in the students that are residing in Athens and attending another school. So it's quite complex that way, and then it's averaged out over three years. So next year would be the third year Maple Grove is. Well. <coughs> so you'll be receiving the full state revenue for that attendance. It, that'll be more solid, yes. Jim. How many open enroll? First of all, I want to state I'm not against parochial schools, but they, they are part of the budget to a point. How many open enroll to the parochial schools here in town that we lose on that number that you said? So the question is, uh, how many students open enroll to um, the private or parochial schools? Um, we have Trinity and St. Anthony, obviously, in our village and in our community. Um, they're not part of the open enrolled in or out because they're not counted as part of our resident students. So if a family chooses that choice, they just go and enroll to either of those parochial schools. How that choice does impact um, our budget is that both <coughs> schools participate in the voucher or choice program in the state. So if a, a family meets a certain criteria, there are so many vouchers available that would help to offset or waive the costs, but the money would follow those students, and that amount this year is um, approximately $184,000. Now, just, I know that, again, the, it's state law, so you can't do anything about it, and I'm not saying it should be. But my question is now when, when I know we have to provide busing for them, does that come out of their district, out of their schools, or is that a freebie on the school district of Athens? So the question is about the requirement um, to provide busing. 
Actually, we're not required uh, to provide busing um, unless a student with a disability needs some services that we provide at our school, then we are held liable for that. Um, we have had some agreements over the years um, because a school board could make a decision to offer some of that transportation. Um, if buses are going by the schools um, and we have an agreement that we don't add more money, let's say to our transportation costs, that's a good agreement because as those students graduate eighth grade, we want a strong partnership with their families because they will become our high school students. So that's a positive agreement that we could be um, in agreement with. Um, we did make a change in the last year. Uh, we were providing some additional transportation for some classes that were occurring at our high school. We have um, worked with our parochial schools and they have now assumed some of those costs. So they are good partners. We want to remain that solid partnership with them because again, they're most of them typically families in our community um, and those students hopefully will be our students when they become freshmen. So um, we want that strong partnership back and forth. Um, we also offer, and it's by federal law, if the parochial schools would like to participate in any federal programs, like Title I, Title II, Title III, or Title IV, um, they have that legal right as well. So again, that's a strong partnership we have back and forth also. So, I mean, I'm just, because sometimes um, I remember where, where I grew up, it was, we're not, it's, it doesn't affect us. So to a point, it would be, I'm just curious now, so a school district like, let's just say Edgar, they could actually say that we don't want to bus, they, they I mean, I'm just, I'm just curious if they want it, I'm just, I'm just saying like, if it, you know, for budgetary reasons, is that, I mean, that's possible. I thought it was state law that you had to bus them, so I'm, I'm on, I'm learning, I'm learning something here, so I was just kind of, I'm just kind of curious, because it's, it affects the whole community, and I, you know, Maybe some people don't think that, you know, I just was kind of bringing it to the forefront, I guess. So Jim's question is around trans, I'll just say transportation in general. Um, there are certainly state statutes when it's public uh, schools and public education of what we're required to provide for transportation. Um, again, in the school district of Athens, we do benefit and receive some transportation aid just due to our amount of acreage and area um, within our district. Um, again, though, we need to be good stewards of our money when it comes to transportation. So we do negotiate uh, with Fisher uh, Bus Company. They are outsourced uh, to do our transportation. So each year we negotiate a contract. So back to draw a connection to budget reductions, that will be ongoing conversations for next year. We'll look at ways that we can um, relook at the amount of money that we expend on our transportation contract. So required by law for public schools. Uh, not uh, for parochial or private, but you certainly, Board of Ed could engage and have some um, agreements um, with other uh, private institutions in your in your area. And again, I think for the right reasons, those conversations occur. Yes, Andy. You got to remember though too that all those families that have their children in those schools are paying the same school taxes that everybody else is. That's correct. So in a way, they are paying for their busing. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So Andy, I just wanted us to remember that uh, families are also paying and required to pay for school tax on um, whether they choose to send their child to parochial or to private or um, public school. So that's a good point. So referendum doesn't pass. I've heard so many things. We don't get this referendum, the school's closing. What's our next step and is it six months? Is it a year? What's the process then? Uh, so the comment is, what's the, the process if the referendum, the voters don't approve um, the April 4th referendum? We've indicated that uh, the Board of Education will engage in conversations around potential consolidation or closing. Um, it may be too premature to depend on which route they would need to go at this time. Um, I give an example to a community member today. Um, let's say that the voters don't approve uh, the referendum and there are families in our community who could make the choice to open enroll. That window for open enrollment is still open till the end of April. We may see families that start to make that choice. We may have other families that have um, means or opportunities and <coughs> they end up leaving our community. So instead of having 427 students as of today, on March 16th, May 1st, we hypothetically could be at 300. June, we could be at 200. If people indicate and see what might be coming, um, we would need to take a look at that point, what we're going to be doing. So those are conversations that will be held in open session with the Board of Education. What measures have been taken to cut costs already? Uh, the question is, uh, what measures have been taken to cut costs already? So uh, during the November uh, 2022 uh, school board meeting, approximately two uh, weeks after the voters uh, did not approve that referendum that was on the ballot, 
Um, I opened up conversation um, with the Board of Education to give them a plan around budget reductions. Um, and then in December, each of our campus principals um, held meetings with all of our staff members to gather ideas of where we would be um, potentially making reductions. During the past several board meetings, three uh, in particular, there have been a list of reductions that either are occurring or will be occurring. Um, and we anticipate um, we will need to uh, non-renew approximately nine to 11 staff members. So staffing is part of that plan as well. Um, and that will take uh, effect or be an impact on positions by next fall. And what kind of savings is that for reductions? Um, adding all of those different reductions together is probably $900,000. When you just said that nine to 11 staff will <coughs> reductions happen even if this referendum passes? Yes. Okay. This year our rating budget was approximately $8 million and our expenditures <coughs> um, that were presented during the annual meeting and budget hearing in September were 8.9. That's where we came up with the 900000 So I would just like to make a comment as a parent. In a survey that was done last summer, parents are saying that it's important for their kids to have small class sizes, to have quality education. And in order to do that, it takes money. So now we're having to cut 9 to 11 positions where we're looking at classes growing. And I think that that's kind of the charm of Athens for a lot of people who come here. Maybe, you know, I've seen in my kids' classes, kids move away, come back. And it's because of that reason and the teachers that we have. And so if we want to be competitive with surrounding communities, keep our class sizes at a manageable size, we have to remember that that takes money. And so we need to invest in our schools that way. So, I mean, I think it's things that we have to lose, you know, 9 to 11 positions. Um, and we're going to feel that on the back end. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe. When you say 9 to 11 staff, you break that down like how many teachers, how many age, <coughs> janitorial, administration, can you break that down, please? Sure. I can do a generalization um, because right now a finalized list has not been presented to the Board of Education. They'll need to approve those final reductions. Um, but in all the areas you just indicated, we will see a um, reduction in uh, contractual time for administration. We'll see a reduction in certified staff, as in teachers, and that's uh, classroom educators, as well as encore, like music and art and other areas like that. Um, there will be uh, paraeducators who will work less hours. Um, we will be taking a look at um, not continuing to maintain a fitness center coordinator. Um, we have been reducing um, athletic coaches. That was a process that started already in the past year. Um, so it's not just one in area in particular. It's really every department um, from the central office to the campus to the classroom and then all of the different departments. So um, based upon we do have board policy that helps to drive those decisions as well as enrollment numbers um, as well as student needs. So a lot of information was collected over the past three months to make informed decisions in that process. Welcome. What's the average class size of campus? Um, approximately nine students to one educator. Yes. Okay, so just out of curiosity, um, <coughs> you said you you guys worked on a five-year budget. Yes. I think that's what you said. Earlier, yes. Right? And this is a four-year referendum. So what does your five look like? Sorry. Say the referendum passes. What does your five look like? Um, so we're actually operating in year one, um, and then the refer referendum would take into account years two, three, four, and five, um, because that five-year budget was actually developed and built prior to going to the referendum question in November. So this potentially would have been year one that we're currently living in right now, which is why we're making the reductions, because we didn't exceed the revenue cap. Um, we have... A lot of numbers and data in particular. Um, yeah. Are there certain numbers in particular? Well, okay. I, mean, I think the obvious question is what happens after it <coughs> is ends? You know, because we're going to obviously be sitting here again. Okay. So, thank you. Thanks for clarifying. So the question is, um, what happens when um, in four years, if the voters approve this operational referendum, what happens then? Um, I've 
use the phrase that um, a non-reoccurring referendum is really a short-term solution for a long-term problem. So there is absolutely the potential that in two and a half to three years, we could be back in the community talking about where we are from a financial standpoint with the potential to have to go back to another referendum five years from now, if you will, although that process really does start about 18 months prior. Uh, there are still some unknowns. Um, we don't know um, yet the final uh, governor's budget, which will impact our state aid, um, which can impact our formulas as well. Um, to the question of what about the enrollment, we're watching the enrollment and hopefully our enrollment as a district continues to increase, that would positively impact our budget. So it's still, um, to forecast out five years, we use conservative numbers, but every year those numbers fluctuate and change. So there could be the potential that we would be back here talking with our community um, if indeed um, we're in a different precarious situation. Um, I will say though that we have a strategic plan. We're in year one of four um, that does give us uh, guidance and direction on how we'll be allocating our monies. Uh, we are good stewards of that money, so the reductions that occur um, during the next six months that will impact the upcoming year, we'll continue to analyze and find out if there are things that we'll be able to, let's say, um, rehire some staff next year if the budget is um, healthier. Um, we'll look to rebuild that fund balance for long-term stability. There are some additional funds that we might want to start to exercise. There's a Fund 46, um, which is intended to help with deferred maintenance projects over time. We would receive some tax benefits. So it's being proactive and thinking about that forecast of a five-year budget model, but within that time period, really, again, I use that we're being proactive in doing things that sets the district and the community up for success. Um, so being diligent about that moving forward. Did I answer your question? Okay, thank you. Cindy. <laughs> Either of well, you? What are the odds? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you can't go up. Yeah. Yeah. I was just gonna say, I think that uh, uh, what Jim said is true, though. Um, uh, our district and many other districts in the state are going to be looking at financial problems in the short term again and whatever if the, the um, government doesn't restructure how schools are funded. I, you know, that's the root of the problem is reallocating how schools are funded in the first place. In these statements is around maybe uh, government taking a look at reallocating that state funding or looking at the state funding formula. I'll just add an interesting fact. Last year in the state of Wisconsin, there were more operational and capital referendums than ever in history. <coughs> That's a pretty staggering statement and it's accurate and true. Um, and that might indicate that maybe the system needs to be relooked at again. So we kind of hit this prophecy at the top of the mountain, if you will, of oh my, like mm -hmm. so many districts need. And those are all size districts. We have all size districts across the state. So, um, and that funding formula impacts you depending on your size, large or small, and in between. So it's a good statement. And then, Jefferson. So what is the greatest cost that the debt is incurred in the first place? Or the greatest reason <laughs> that you're not working on a balanced budget to start with and incurring the debt? Sure. So the question is, um, if I could paraphrase, what occurred for us to have to incur the amount of debt that we have right now? Um, I would say there were multiple factors um, that if we look at all of that together is where we got to where we are right now. Um, I'll go back to that declining enrollment, over 100 students over a 10 year period of time. Um, as the numbers continue to decrease, then there needed to be some type of proactive measure in response to that. Um, I'll say a, the proactive measure that occurred was a proactive Board of Education and Administration who went looking for an option and opportunity, and that was to acquire a charter school. I will say, though, anytime, as I indicated, when you acquire a property, a facility, you need money to open and operate, and the way the school funding formula is, is um, developed, you can't count new students all in one year. <coughs> so even if we see additional enrollment of students, which will help us receive more state aid on students, it doesn't come all at once. So it was a proactive measure uh, to respond to declining enrollment to open up a new school, but it takes money to open up a new school, so there are some few years, which is where we are right now. And then over time, as we get to um, proactively count the students that might be new, those open enrolled in, and maintain the students that we have here, then we're gonna see that um, be able to be more stable in our finances. So um, enrollment, um, additional facility and buildings, and in addition, costs continue to increase. 
Um, I use example um, insurance costs. Um, every uh, two to three years, we negotiate a better rate for insurance. Um, better in the fact that um, hopefully it doesn't triple somewhere. It just, the insurance rates are they're very expensive, and that's part of our compensation package. Uh, transportation in the last year or two, gas prices have significantly increased. Transportation overall, again, something we're required to offer um, in our public schools, but then we need to pay uh, through that process. So the increase in costs as well then also have an impact on our overall budget. So all of those pieces um, do have an, in, uh, they do impact our overall operating budget over time. Um, and I can add to that too, the, um, the state gives us a per pupil dollar amount and that per pupil dollar amount has not increased, um, that revenue has not increased at the same rate as the inflation for the past mm, six years, eight years. So it hasn't stayed steady with that either. And I'll just add, we're looking at our graph here for four years from 2015 through 2019. We had zero, right? Yep. Zero increase. So our costs are going up, but inflation and the amount of money per pupil we're getting from our state is at zero. So our costs are going up and we're not getting any more <coughs> money, plus these other things are starting to have pressure on our, our finances as well. So, um, so it's a long answer to the question, but it, I hope it indicates that there's a lot of different pressures that um, impact our overall operating budget. With the cut in staffing, what classes will be affected? What will you not be offering? Or how is that going to affect the students? So the question is, um, with the cuts in staff, uh, what classes might we not offer? How will that impact students? Um, I'll start with the latter. Anytime, um, first and foremost, we, we have to let a staff member go. That's both emotional and, and heart-wrenching, and so that's difficult just to get through that process. Um, it does impact size of classes. It might impact programming. Um, as we looked at our numbers for enrollment across the district, again, from pre-K through grade 12, um, there will be some classes at the elementary um, where we will collapse them. Um, so if there were two sections this year and the numbers were small enough to make that manageable next year, then those two um, sections will create one in a grade level. Um, at the secondary, um, we really did look at the number of students per grade in the middle school and how many teachers we will need to be able to teach those students. At the high school, we certainly have graduation requirements, which actually drove some of those decisions. There are certain content areas we, we need to be able to require to offer classes. Um, some of the electives, we might have to collapse those as well and tighten up some options. So um, we, we looked across the board at everything. And this isn't official yet, but at the last school board meeting, summer school programming yeah. was considered not being, yeah. not happening, at least for this year. children were quite sad to hear that that's probably going to be gone because it was a pretty neat program and I have a student that is heading into junior high this year who could have had his first chance to try the programs up there which are some pretty neat programs that get our kids not only doing another course but take them other places and give them other um, learning uh, learning abilities and places to learn and go More of a statement, but um, when you start reducing staff, um, a lot of times you don't cut an entire program, but you cut it down in full-time equivalency. And what that creates is like this revolving door of teachers because you know someone will come in and take that job to get some experience, but ultimately they have to support it themselves and their families, and so they leave for a job with the full-time position. So one of the struggles that you have to think about in a smaller district is sometimes you have to put a little extra money in to keep those positions full time so that you can get a good program in place because having um, a different teacher every year for 10 years is not the same as having the same teacher building their program over 10 years. Thank you for that comment um, and I can draw the connection to um, on the front page of our handout that um, icon that talks about uh, rebuilding financial stability and I can draw the connection to the first icon, which is not only retaining but attracting our high quality staff. The two go hand in hand. Um, another reduction that we're experiencing in the upcoming year is for our staff that will be with us. Um, we're reducing some of our benefits, like an HSA, 
um, as well as um, we're going to be flat. We're not going to be able to offer any additional raises, anything even close to a CPI. So over time, to your point, um, people have to make an important decision not only about themselves, their career, their families, and determine can I stay in a district if I know that the financial outlook is, is that over some time. So um, we're very cognizant of that as well and, and obviously recognize that it could potentially impact not only our staff that are remaining, but into the future also. So thank you for your comments, Jim. Um, one of the things that was brought up at the last meeting when I was at the Town of Johnson um, was <coughs> the informational handout and how get uh, connecting with the no voters. Um, there was, I mean, first hand you saw it, the dis how people were disapproving of some of the handouts. Um, it not stating certain things on there. <coughs> I guess. For one was that if this referendum doesn't pass, <clears throat> we can't go for another year. And I think most people don't know that. Also, another thing was the consolidation of schools. I know you stated that right away, but a lot of people, like I said, think that it's just the high school and elementary that are going to combine. Is there been, I mean, it's been eight days, has there been any um, talks? about different handouts, different ways to approach the no voters. Um, I know my wife and Jill, some other people, but there was, I don't forget how many people were there, I think 15, 16 people at that last meeting. And I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces that are at this same meeting. So, I mean, we have, I mean, just roughly what, 40 people here. And so we have 50 people to show up at two meetings out of the whole town of Athens. How are you getting to the no voters, or how are you informing the no voters? I'm not saying that you're going to switch their vote, but how are we getting to the no voters and informing them that the track's not on there, that it's not just a consolidation of the two schools, it's a consolidation of the other ones? How are we reapproaching that? Because I believe that was a very agreed upon statement at that meeting, and I don't know what the, the voice here is. But it's been eight days. What has been done since those eight, for eight days? So the, the question is around the information, the fact sheet that we have available, the things that we have out in the community as part of our communication plan. Um, that plan was presented at the last board meeting, um, and it was comprehensive in nature. Um, and I hear what you're saying, Jim. Um, there are certainly questions that come up in these meetings that I can answer or members of our team can answer. But uh, to now suggest a whole new communication plan could also create some confusion in the community. Um, so we're going to stay our course with what we have. Um, again, we have at least, you say, 40 people in this environment as well. Um, there are postcards that um, have been and will be mailed. We have backpack flyers going out. Um, we have uh, radio spots. Um, there's communication that's been in the record review. There's communication that will come in the salesman SAM. Um, we're constantly populating our website and keeping that information accurate. We have added some new information um, as, as we've progressed over the last couple of weeks. Um, we're also feeding um, our social media sites as well. So we're looking for all of the avenues that we could communicate out into the public. But we did have a plan at the beginning, um, well over probably a <coughs> weeks ago. We also have yard signs, banners, posters, boards. Um, so we're trying a lot of different avenues to get the information out. If someone's not on Facebook, um, then they get the postcards. We give them information. Come to these meetings, you get information. Um, we have some businesses in town that have boards up for us as well. Um, but we're going to be consistent with that message so that we don't also create any confusion out into the community. I guess follow up on that how much different was the the plan than the first plan that failed that's I mean I just so looking forward if the referendum passes I mean and we are gonna have to run in four years again it should be looked at I mean yeah I mean I think it's a little bit more urgency people are finding out now but doing the same thing I mean I run a business and I built it off of advertising and promoting it properly and if I did something that failed out, uh, failed once, I relook at it. So, I mean, how much difference are we looking at right now? 
I'm just kind of curious myself. So the, the question Jim's asking is the difference in communication plan from the fall referendum to now. Um, and my response to that is the fall referendum also included a second question. Um, and so we had an operational question and we had a capital question. So we had twice the amount of information and trying to make as clear as we could and concise the difference between two types of referendum questions. In addition, when you look at the graph at the bottom of page two here, um, it's very explicit around school tax and it's only the operational impact. Um, the graphs and information we shared in the fall, we had to try our best to show what the impact would be in year one for an operational, year one for a capital, because there was no impact, then year two for an operational, and year <coughs> two for a capital. So to compare a communication plan from the fall when that campaign focused on two questions, one operational and, and one capital. This is one operational. This one is a four-year non-reoccurring. That was reoccurring. So the feedback we gather, both informal and formal, impacted and helped us design the communication plan now for this referendum in April. But the two, plan the two referendums themselves were very different. So the information had to be very different as well. Regarding the last referendum that failed. Sure. Now, let's say hypothetically this one passes. How soon are you going to come back to the table with a referendum to do all those capital repairs that were on that second refer second question of the referendum? So the, the question is, um, how quickly would we come back to the community and engage in conversation around a potential capital? And um, a capital referendum is intended to be focused on uh, facilities. So capital, very large sum projects. Um, I'm going to be quite honest and say probably already this summer or fall we'll start to gather um, our community and listening sessions and forecast ahead. Um, do we maintain the facilities that we have? Um, the charter school, the elementary, and the middle and the high. Right now we're operating three facilities. Um, during our survey process last summer we asked the community would you be interested in one pre-k through 12 traditional school facility adding on and our elementary um, would be um, at the middle and high school. That would be a conversation we would potentially want to come back and continue to explore with the community because the more facilities you have, the more that takes to operate. Um, and then there could be other options that we consider. The track has been brought up that's been on hold um, since 2018. We've not had an operable track. Um, I mentioned the um, playground here at the elementary school. If we didn't uh, consolidate our own elementary middle and high and we came back and take a look at that playground, that would be something. Um, the rough at Maple Grove um, needs to be tended to sooner instead of later. So we would probably start with the survey data that we received last summer, build upon that, have listening sessions, and then forecast ahead our vision for three to five to ten years out for 20. I'll have the meeting chats been going. Uh, I haven't made it to any of them. And I feel like those might reach some of the community that has some of the questions and and possibly some of the no votes. <laughs> sure. Um, so the question is, how are the meet and chats um, going? Um, and I'll say, um, I think good. Um, I drink a lot of coffee, for those that know me. So going to the cafe early for coffee and meeting people in the community, I appreciate and enjoy that opportunity. Um, and to your point, some people that come and talk over coffee feel more comfortable there than in a large setting like this. So uh, actually doubled the amount of the chats and coffee. <coughs> and this time we're also offering um, come for, um, Andy, what do you say, chips for lunch at um, on the square, right? You're buying, chips. Huh? <laughs> um, so come for a chip um, and chat there as well. So yeah, again, trying to... The uh, after the hours? How come uh, they're all during... After the hours. Work hours. So working people can't attend your meet and chat. That's a good point. Um, It's a, yeah, okay, so that's just what's fair. One-on-one um, -on -one meetings, conversations, uh, phone calls, emails. Um, yes, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, approximately how many people are like, at your chats like that? Are you reaching? The first one is started with over about a four hour period of time. So you get into a few. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It starts typically with those that meet us right away at, at seven. We're in a back booth. And, and anybody's welcome to come or tell your neighbor or friends or others. Um, we kind of start in the back. Um, and then naturally or organically, I, you know, if there's a break, I get up and walk around. Um, um, there are other people. 
people that see me that invite me over to join their conversation and one table just kept kind of growing because more people kept joining us so um, it's a comfortable um, conversation and a comfortable space and I think people appreciate that. Yes. Um, no. What is the cost each time to the district that we have to go to the fund though? Like I know there's materials that are donated by certain people but what is the cost that we look at each time we have to go through this process? So Jill's question is, um, what are the costs each time we have to prepare um, to go to referendum? So um, I can't give you an exact figure, but I can tell you some of the costs associated with referendum. Um, first and foremost, there's some legalities. So we work with a bond council who helps us to draft the legal language that um, then is presented and will eventually be the language that's on uh, the ballot um, that has to come through um, a legal process, if you will. And so it's called bond council. Um, we also then uh, do obviously have some printing costs and other things associated with materials. We do have donations that offset those costs because there's only so much that we can do as a district. So we have some very generous people in the community who have made donations to help offset those costs as well. So that becomes kind of a, a wash. So there's um, the formal or legal part that has a cost to it as well as the promotional and communication pieces also. So I don't have an exact figure because we have donations that offset some of yeah, that. Sure. Yes. One of the things I remember from one of my many referendum meetings um, in the past is somebody said something about, and I was thinking of this the other day when I was watching, listening to the news and they were talking about the United Kingdom leaving the European Union and there's a lot of regrets now that people didn't think it through and now the United Kingdom's really struggling. But one of the things that was brought up is, and Jimmy kind of referred to it, if I think the school district is still the largest employer so just the school shutting is just like the peak of the iceberg. It's like, it will affect our gas stations, our restaurants, our, our doctors. Will we be able to keep a doctor in Athens? You know, across the board, Athens will suffer if we don't have schools here. So I know it happened to Dorchester. Um, and that's just something somebody needs to think of. A lot of people need to think about. Because we're sitting pretty nice with a doctor and a dentist and how much of that will we maintain? Because we will lose people. If the kids go to a different school, we will lose people. Our, do our health values go down if we don't have a school? Yes. yes. Oh, a lot. The property value decreases. decreases. So, you know, I, I, it's not a good thing. So that's something that needs to be brought up to people. I'm trying to, I had one other point, I can't remember some another. However, when Colby closed Dorchester, Dorchester still survived. It was hard. My children were in that school when they closed it. But it was a measure that had to be done to balance their budget. And now, there's still as many houses in Dorchester as there was before. And they didn't have a grocery store, and they didn't have a doctor, and they didn't have all that before, before the schools closed. Because they still have, 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 but if you look well, at Dorchester, it seems like up. it's they just use it as storage and as a different facility. I can't go there and get my farm supplies anymore. I do all the way, way to Owen. Mm -hmm. Now, is that because Riverland joined them? No, it, it was because okay. the town didn't have. Uh, well, I mean, the the town was without funds in the town and people in the town and families shopping in the town. Those businesses lose out, and it doesn't make sense to keep something there. I know if my children end up going to a different school, I'm not coming to Athens to get gas. I'm not coming to get groceries. I'm not coming in for a fish fry. I am going to go to Medford, Abbotsford, Edgar, wherever the heck I end up or choose to put my kids. I'm not gonna be coming into this town to get things. And I'm a pretty strong supporter in this town. And I also wanna say like anybody who thinks our staff and um, people that work for the school here it, that I, I know I heard some things about what we pay people and who makes what money. We are one of the lower paying districts. And I can attest to being a substitute teacher that hear that I could definitely go make more money somewhere else. But because of this community and the heart that's in these schools, I choose to come here. 
and I could just drive a couple more miles and make a lot more money. But I, I don't because of what is here and what our kids have in our school and community. Just for clarification, we are the lowest. The average salary and the salary and fringe benefits are the lowest in Athens compared to surrounding communities. So that tells me our staff and people are here because they want to be and they enjoy being here. And smaller class sizes are a draw for teachers as well. Sometimes oh. the money's not worth it if you are going to have this huge class and it's just stress beyond belief. Like the smaller class sizes are more manageable. You have, you know, it just makes teaching all that much better. I imagine the teacher shortage is still having an impact because salaries have to go up or you won't keep teachers. I, I know a teacher from Colby that had to come to, a, she had to to get a raise in her district. She applied in Athens. And then what Athens offered her, she went back to her district and then they would give her a raise. So it's kind of meaty out there for teachers right now. And I know that there's extreme shortages in some areas. Everybody wants tech classes and I love our tech teacher. I hear he's doing great things. But <laughs> I think the people have to realize that if you want a tech teacher, you're gonna have to pay for a tech teacher. Um, and, and if you overload the teachers, they're gonna have to really, really love it here to stay here. So it's 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 a it's a fact of life. There's a teacher. Is there still a teacher shortage? Uh, nationally, yes. How about here? Uh, we were fortunate to fill all of our positions in the past year. Okay, but do you remember when you used to have 50 and 100 teachers applying for a job, and you don't get that many applications anymore? And and sometimes you have to take who you think is the best, even though if you would like someone of a different caliber. That's what I hear. So um, if we don't keep our district and our teachers happy and our kids happy and our parents happy and our community happy, I don't see a lot of good going. The school is the heart of the community. It always has been. So there's so many factors to think about. And I have to advocate for teachers because <laughs> I don't know how hard you have to work. I just want to add, like I don't have kids in school, I don't have kids. But I have friends that are my age that do have kids in school. And like to people who, I mean, I don't know who's here that's gonna vote no, but just based on, you know, some people that I do know that don't know the severity. My friends send their kids here. Sure, they can go to Edgar or they could go to Medford, but they choose to come here. Like if this place closes or consolidates with Edgar, I don't, like what is, what is the